from CBS. And man, oh my god, this is my favorite woman. Um, so she is the woman who built the museum, uh, Weed Maps Museum of Weed last year. Uh, a lot of great stuff. Other than that, also now she's a co-founder of Go, Go Creative Group. New gig, congratulations and good luck. I'm gonna shout. Hi everyone, welcome to the event. Super excited to see all of your faces here. I'm glad that you could join us. We are going to have an action-packed evening. Um, you know, we really designed this evening for you guys. So we're gonna dig into the weeds. We have a powerhouse uh, you know, crew on the panel that are experts in experiential marketing. So we're gonna go over everything from the future of experiential, what tools and tactics that they use um, in order to execute memorable campaigns. Uh, and at the end, uh, there's time for you guys to ask questions. So again, this is about you this evening. Um, our experts are here to share their uh, knowledge and insight and wisdom. And you know, we'll make sure that you guys get that time to ask questions at the end. So Sanan just went through introductions, um, but what I would love is, you know, starting with you, Gabrielle, is just a quick overview about you know, who you are and what you actually do. Like, what does your company actually do? So that, you know, we're all friends here now, so I want to make sure that everyone knows everyone and really kind of understands the perspective uh, that each of our panelists are coming from. So we'll start with you. Sure. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm uh, getting through something, so if I sound like a dying frog up here, I apologize in advance. Um, well, uh, I come from a bit of a mixed bag background. Um, I started in creative and digital agencies um, with focus on content, and then I moved into the influencer space. Um, I sort of tripped and fell into MCNs. If any of you guys know what, what that was, and that was an interesting experiment. Um, and then <clears throat> went and worked for some media companies, and then went uh, agency side again, and found myself most recently at a very, very large media company called Future. We are a global company uh, that works in uh, print, digital, and, um, and content, video content, um, across the entire world. Um, here in the US, <clears throat> you may know some of our publications, tech creative, well, we're very happy in, in tech, a gaming, um, and music verticals. Um, so we have Tech Radar, we have Piece of Gamer, we're on the Games and Games Radar, we have Tom's Guide, we own all the Mobile Nation sites. Um, and that's just our consumer facing sites. We literally have hundreds of B2B and industry sites as well. So my role is uh, twofold. One it is to work with our brands to come up with interesting um, programs that connect us with our readers, audiences, um, and, and build experiences for them to connect them with the brands that we own and operate. But also is to work on the um, commercial side of the business. So to work with our sponsors, you know, we are we are a, a for-profit company, um, as much as the editors will love that they share with us for their for their opinions to be shared to the world. Um, but yeah, all of our sponsors and partners on the commercial side, um, I'm sure we're going to talk about how experiential is in very high demand um, right now as a, as a marketing channel. So they are constantly asking for how do we go above and beyond the, um, the, uh, the display ad and above and beyond um, the branded content into something that really connects with people on a more visceral level. So those are the, the types of um, programs that I lead um, at, at Future. Awesome, awesome. Um, why don't you So, um, I'm Stephanie. I am an exec executive producer of Immersive at Framestore. And most of you guys probably have heard of Framestore if you're in Hollywood. Uh, we are a world um, globally placed uh, VFX company. And uh, in addition to film, TV, commercials, um, and all the kinds of areas that VFX exists, we have a branch within it um, that is labeled Immersive. And that covers a, a variety of areas. So we uh, do rides, um, experiential um, uh, activations. Uh, we have a labs group that does also uh, more experimental type of activations. Um, VR, AR, kind of basically a, a real-time based um, area where we're pushing visuals and we're pushing experiences. So um, I head up the LA office um, under that group. Um, just a little bit in terms of my background. 
Uh, I also, I come from, it, it, funny is that uh, Framestore is actually kind of the first VFX company that I've worked at because I come from more interactive and experiential uh, background. I was at Disney for several years. I like to say three tours for those people who understand how Disney works. Um, and, uh, and, and one of those tours, I was uh, in Imagineering R&D and we were focused on connected experiences, basically focused on making sure that uh, we were looking to design and implement and launch and maintain with the parks um, projects that were on the smaller end of the budget, um, but also really leveraging existing um, platforms that guests were bringing into the park, so say your mobile phones. Um, so that's what our, our mandate was, and then after that I moved over to Disney Consumer Products and worked on um, a wearable IoT product geared at uh, encouraging imaginative play, um, and it was an interesting experiment and also a great learning experience in terms of taking products from research and development, like true research and development, um, where you're building uh, the prototype the, the, from the hardware to the software platform to the content design, all the way to uh, uh, market and to, to the mass market and bringing it on shelf. So that's a little bit of my background um, and what I do. Hi, I'm Cynthia Beemster. Um, I um, work at Viacom CBS as the creative lead. Um, Viacom, uh, we have a lot of in CBS that have a lot of properties like uh, Nickelodeon, MTV, Paramount. Um, what we do is we sit under the sales umbrella. It's called Advanced Advertising Innovation Products. So we are the only ones within Viacom that are looking at um, innovative solutions like VR, AR, holograms, digital humans um, with the sales lens. So we try to create opportunities for our brands, like creating an augmented reality app for Nickelodeon, or creating a VR experience for Clusterfest, or Comedy Central, or something custom for VidCon, and eventually getting an advertiser to sponsor it or be a part of it. Hi, I'm Madeline Donegan, and you'll have to forgive me if I'm a bit slow. I'm combating a migraine at the moment. Um, I am the co-founder and chief brand officer of Pro Creative Group, which is a new age creative agency in Hollywood that specializes in branding, experiential, and production. Um, a little bit about my background. I started in branding and marketing in the cannabis space, actually, and worked with uh, many different brands, most recently uh, Weed Maps, building the Weed Maps Museum of Weed, as Sanan mentioned earlier. So within the cannabis space, there being so many parameters around marketing, what you can not can't do. Experience was a, a large part of how they kind of perform and try to touch different consumers in different ways. So the Museum of Weed was the kind of tentpole project that I've worked on in the experiential world, but it was a 30,000 square foot activation that touched everything from AR to VR to storytelling and everything in between. Um, it's a little bit different than I think a trade show activation in that we were a three month long um, Sorry, a little caught up here. Uh, we were we were a three month long um, activation, and from there, a lot of other opportunities came about to continue to do large, larger scale experiential events for other companies, both endemically in the cannabis space and non endemically. So that's kind of what we're focused on right now is is building out and designing activations for brands around the world who are interested in engaging with consumers in a new and interesting way. Awesome, cool. So let's actually dive in. And one of the things I want to start with, I want to start raw. So experiential is such a multifaceted, uh, weighty term. So you hear experiential marketing thrown around a ton. Um, but I would really love to know from each of our panelists, what exactly does experiential marketing mean to you? Um, starting with Madeline, if you guys would, would give like a one minute overview of what that really means to you, what does it mean to your company? Um, and what are you trying to achieve with experiential marketing um, with your company? So, Madeline, you can kick us off. Yeah, um, experiential marketing, I think, is any tangible, in real life experience that a consumer gets to engage with a brand or an activation. I think it's um, there's a high demand for experiential marketing right now, which is, I think, why we're all sitting up here right now. And it offers consumers an opportunity to not just be an observer of the brand, but rather a participant. And there's a lot of um, advantageous things that come from that. I think that the sentiment around your brand, being able to connect directly with people, being able to really tell a story that can't be told through, say, a 2D advertisement or a digital advertisement or something that people are engaging with as an observer, 
Uh, experiential marketing is based a lot on, and this is a vague statement, but emotion and connection, and really people creating resonance within your brand and, and loyalty within your brand by who you are instead of just what you do and what services you provide. So experiential marketing is um, very connected, and if done well and done right, you know, people leave having a better sense of why they should care about what you're doing, what your brand is doing, and why they should come back and continue to be loyal consumers. So that's kind of why I think right now it's so important that experiential is kind of considered just a general part of marketing strategy um, with, with many brands. And for us on the agency side, that's kind of what we're seeing across the board is brands wanting to do something a little bit uplifted, a little bit different, and really connect with their audience in a unique and innovative I love that. I should point out two things I think that you said that were super powerful. So loyalty, um, leveraging experiential as a vehicle to build loyalty, and then also we'll talk about digital channels. A lot of brands are kind of shifting their budget away from heavily investing in digital to more experiential campaigns, which we'll talk about as well. So us, uh, why don't you? Yeah. So I mean, kind of building off of that, you know, for us, um, uh, Viacom and excuse me if I don't say Viacom CBS, I don't know Viacom. <laughs> We've always been wanting to connect with fans. We've been connected through our stories and through television and through digital. And as it's expanded, we always had our tent poles, which were like the VMAs and the Kids' Choice Awards, which is really exciting. And everyone would come to those events, and that's where they were hoping to engage with our talent and to find those stories. So now Viacom has seen that the fans first lens where they're trying to invest in events like a VidCon, uh, the view purchase, we're trying to do um, the cluster fest, which I mentioned, which is Comedy Central, um, we're trying to do a uh, Snow Globe Music Festival. All of these are ways that we can expand our fan base, expand our stories, uh, and, and also have our, our users be able to put their phones down and experience something. Um, if I pick their phones up and do anything, I have. <laughs> something and that's where you're going to get the people. People aren't going to be watching that 30 second ad anymore. So when we used to be able to sell that, for experiential for us is finding a way so people can engage with our brands and our advertisers. Uh, so for Supreme Store, we often work with our clients on figuring out what it is that they are looking to do. And so um, yeah, we're in kind of a little bit more of a position in which we're more like collaborators with our clients. And, uh, they usually come with an IP, um, an idea in mind, an event in mind. And so from, from the perspective that our, our team um, takes is that it often is about designing, um, designing an event, designing a moment, designing a uh, transcendent, transformative kind of experience. I know those are kind of lofty words, but a lot of times what it is is taking this brand or story or narrative and making sure that people feel something. Um, and just this is a lot of it, to be honest, is echoing what these two just said because, uh, you know, with experience marketing, there's a lot of it is, at the core of it is that connection and that emotion. So um, uh, just as an example, uh, for some, uh, some of the work that we've done, um, it, it really centers around, okay, here is a particular storyline that we need to um, highlight or an IP. Maybe it's a season of Game of Thrones that's coming out, um, and it's about building the hype. Um, so we are really focused on um, certain goals that are already set out with those markers, with the, the clients at the outset, but what it is that your, your, your core goal is to do, you know, whether that is to have a broad reach or to um, reinforce a hardcore fan loyalty. Um, it might be the mix of those two, in which case, you know, you have to design your experience in a specific kind of way, but um, there's, a, there's a lot of different facets to it, but at the core of it, it always comes back down to that, like, emotional connection to that brand. Yeah, I'm gonna, yes, and. <laughs> yeah, like I, said, I, I think digging in deeper, and um, I hope I'm not jumping the gun with this, is that, some of the, the, the things that um, all of you ladies touched on is, is the difference between an event and an experiential marketing activity. Um, and to me, and, and particularly what we do at my company, in lab, it, experiential marketing is 
requires a massive investment. Let's not beat around the bush about it. Um, comparatively to other channels, it is one of the most expensive channels there is, particularly when you're talking about new tech. So for us, it's yes, building all of these emotional connections to what people are doing, but then how do we um, how do we bring that to the audience at large? How do we how do we translate that into something that if you're home and you don't get to go to that, you know, it's still meaningful for you. How do we give you either FOMO or get the get the um, the, the message across in a, in a really important way? So um, being a media company, also hand in hand with experiential marketing is content. Um, I will turn down or shut down any plans, ideas that do not have a content piece attached to it because to me, unless the what you're building is a revenue generating program, like one that you sell tickets for, or um, uh, you, you know that, that you're going to be um, pulling secondary um, funding in with your sponsors, you know, so so your company is also making money off of this act, uh, experience. Um, it, it's it's. It really is important that if, that other people that when you when you look at the ROI for an event and when you're a brand, you know I would not recommend doing something like that. You could spend spending that kind of money for my brand unless it's going to reach the people um, in mass. And so that that's a huge piece of it too. When people we have some very old school people in our in our media company that have been working on our publications for <laughs> 45 years when it was you know print and like still or, or like particularly our music vertical, like our guitar world guys are like old school ponytail guitar playing guys and like we're to, I, and I have to use a very basic explanation of what what experiential is and it's like okay it's something that people can touch and do that means something to them but also somebody that they can something that they can take home and share to their communities and their friends and things like that. Yeah. And I love what you said about you know something that people can touch and see and, and do and you know, that uh, everyone's really touched on evoking emotion. So what I would love to know is how are you evoking emotion in your experiential campaigns? And also, how are you leveraging human-centered perception in regards to the senses that you want to make sure that you tap into for experiential campaigns? Maybe, Sophie, you can kick us off with this discussion. Sure. Um, so I think uh, just to touch on the first part that you asked, I think it's really important um, that when when experiential uh, activations or or when we're setting up and designing experiences, um, you're all already thinking about throughput. You're thinking about number one on the business side: how many people can I get through this? Um, so you're trying to optimize for scale, but what you want to also be able to do is make sure that you are designing for opportunities where moments are unique to each individual, because that's what they're going to take away, and that's what they're going to go talk about. And that's actually also the thing that they're going to distinguish between the first person who did it before them and the person behind them. So I think um, it's it, it comes down to details. It comes down to designing a general uh, layout and then looking at where the opportunities for people to have discovery. Moments of discovery are so incredibly impactful. You kind of don't know all the time exactly when those things are happening, but you can design for them. So uh, that's uh, what kind of the uh, response to the first part. Um, and I lost the second part because I was thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the senses? You know, I think that we're all, you know, you know, the five senses, we right. talk about that in right. marketing, we all know about that, but when I think about experiential campaigns, uh, deploying different experiences, like the, the, the uh, sense of balance, or you know, how, how are those used in creating really memorable campaigns? Uh, so we're talking about what people also call as like 40 elements. We're talking about wind blowing in your face, or the touch of water if you're in, like a, um, in a headset. But there, that, that's one, one aspect. It's not just... Um, uh, what you feel and touch is what you um, hear, you smell. No one, not many people have gone to taste yet, <laughs> but the, um, there, are, there are those opportunities too. And I think it's, it's also making sure that we understand the humans at the core are very visual creatures. We interpret so many things through that, um, through that lens, but the, the moments in which we are designing for those 40 elements are ones where we want emphasis, ones where we want to kind of highlight 
and, um, and bring surprise and, and an element of um, uh, uh, emphasis um, to, to those moments. So um, I think they have to be also um, looked at in kind of a holistic manner, depending on how you design your activation um, and event. If it's all about it, 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 coming back to kind of what the brand and what the goals are, and making sure that there's relevance back to the product, to the brand. Um, if you're telling a story, uh, let's say again, as an example, because we did this um, with Game of Thrones, um, the experience that we built for the AT&T stores, there was a 4D platform um, that we um, designed specifically to have a floor shaker, a wind blowing, and some heat. And the whole point of it is to make you feel like you were um, fighting, uh, fighting with fire, so you needed that extra oomph. But let's say if you were to do that in for um, just for the sake of an example, like a food brand, it doesn't make any sense. So um, I think that kind of is an obvious statement, but it bears repeating because it seems that we always fall into this trap when we're trying to talk through concepts. Is people might be throwing these 4D elements all the time because it's cool or it's interesting and it's like, oh my gosh, this is an incredible moment, but it really does need to be relevant to the whatever story you're telling or the brand that you're trying to push. And um, you bring up a point which triggered something that Gabrielle actually said. So talking about just kind of planning an event versus an activation, you know, marry the audience through how do you actually plan an activation? Um, is there a methodology that you use? Maybe give us a specific example on something that your team has worked on from you know, concept all the way to actually execution. And, and then uh, we'll go into the ROI question after that. Sure, I'll start. Um, I, I think that I, I am a creative, I'm a creative person, but I'm also a pragmatist, and I've also, for the majority of my career, worked in sales development or on the uh, on the agency side, fulfilling something, uh, a framework or a budget map that has already been there. Very, maybe once or twice in my career, somebody said, "Spend whatever you want, do whatever you do, right? Do whatever you want to do." So, okay, maybe. Well, half a time. Uh, never, never happened. So, That's um, awesome. <laughs> um, so to to me, the it is a worthwhile exercise if you have the time and the ability to have a super creative brainstorm where you have all of your research and you 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 understand your audience, you know what your objectives are, and you spend all the time thinking blue sky, blue sky, blue sky. That is totally, totally worth it. But in my world, production timeline, I'm sure all of yours too, production timelines are really, really tight and everybody is working on four project, projects at once. And so really understanding and having a working knowledge of what is possible and what isn't possible within your budget ranges and having people who are super, super skilled at technically making things happen. So you've got a creative, you've got you half a brain on your on your visionary side and half the brain on the practical side, I think from the very beginning is super important when you need to architect out what the concept is. Um, early in the process, I think it's really important to understand the consumer journey through the event. Um, something that's worked for me both now and when I was agency side was to actually, I would, I would write first person um, narrated uh, scripts almost as if I were walking through and this is stream consciousness of what I'm doing and what I'm experiencing. Um, I found that clients really, really loved that. Um, and it, it, so when you're like, I actually picture what I'm going to be doing, I sometimes you picture really wacky stuff and you might not know what you're talking about <laughs> until you take them through that. Um, and then I, I don't think, I don't, I, I think the, the combination of treating clients and process in a, in a traditional agency setting mixed with having people who are super, super buttoned up on the production side is what's always worked the best for me. So um, having your, your client services people still be the ones who are dealing with clients in, in, on the day to day and, and helping them through making choices and refining things, but ultimately um, not expecting people to do both jobs really, really well. There are people who are killer on the ground production people, um, and you will have every single thing buttoned up and all of your budget's perfect, but um, really kind of separating any sort of client input from those execution people, I think is what I found works uh, smoothest because 
um, all planes fancy themselves um, brilliant creative directors, and they're going to want to get in there, and they're going to want to like any any idea of re advertising. I always it's not your baby. This idea is not your baby because by the end of the project, your baby's going to have a head coming out of its arm. It's going to have an eyeball on the back. You know, so so not being precious about it and letting them be involved in way in limited sort of ways that you are managing. Um, I think it's really useful to have that separation when, when putting together programs. And, you know, I'm a tools person. I always like, what tools do people use? So we'd love to know, are there any tools that you use to make this process easier? Have you found that it helps to streamline things, organize moving parts? Walk us through that. Um, you know, it really depends on what organization. I would, I, like, I feel like I've used everything from Basecamp to Asana and everything. But like, project management software is great. Um, having places to keep all of your, we, we use, I'm gonna talk some crap right now. <laughs> we, use, we use Google Docs at, at our office, which Google Docs is great. <laughs> Google Docs is great if you are very, um, uh, very strict on what the organization process is. Otherwise, you've got stuff everywhere. And no, you know, so like, I like repositories um, that are well organized and um, have a little more rigid structure to them. Um, but I don't know. I think as long as you have a tool, I don't have. I, I couldn't live without Evernote. <laughs> awesome, love it. Uh, Natalie, we'd love for you to kind of talk through going into Meet Maps and Meet the Museum of Weed, concepting and planning and execution. Walk us through how your team thought about that and executed. Sure. Um, for us, for this project in particular, you know, drawing back to the importance of business objectives and what the actual company wants to achieve, and for this project, it was largely about education. Um, in parallel with, you know, selling product and making money was, you know, really having to educate the consumer about cannabis in the first place because they don't know how to make informed decisions without the proper education and understanding of what they're purchasing and, and how they're approaching this. So education was the forefront objective of this project. So knowing that, we started with the narrative. And I'm kind of creating the entire story of cannabis history and really worked extensively with internal teams, the experts, if you will, in the cannabis space who really understood what story we were trying to tell, what the objectives were. Another large objective for this activation was brand awareness. Um, this was a massive, like I said, 30,000 square foot of activation. And although revenue was an aspect of this, as it always is, um, it was really about brand awareness, perception, education, and it was a very mission-driven project. So as we kind of moved through this, um, we worked with you know, RFP, multiple agencies, to help execute this vision. And I think one of the most important aspects when, from the client side, trying to figure out how to properly execute something is finding the right partners to work with. Um, we got very lucky with this project. We did a lot of diligence in figuring out who the proper people were. The agency we worked with was spectacularly passionate about the topic at hand and executing it. It was the first of its kind. So it was like a lot of passion wrapped around building a museum of weed, and most of the people were constant consumers already. So it was <laughs> something that people were engaged in excited with. So um, approaching it from the storytelling level and the narrative level was the first thing. But how do we engage? these people as they're walking through, how do we engage visitors and the user journey as mentioned prior um, to really activate the curiosity in people, to really create these sentimental moments that are unique. And so we, from a process perspective, really just started you know, with the storyline and then how do we visually bring this to life? It was, I mean, just dozens of hours of brainstorming creatively, working with the creative teams, um, from the agency side, we were partnered with uh, Virtue, which is Vice Media's agency, and hearing all the different perspectives and how you know everybody has a different nostalgic moment with cannabis or with anything, and what these milestone moments had to be included in order to make people feel connected to the story. Um, and then the biggest goal, at least from our perspective, was to create an emotional environment. So when you walk into each era, if you will. Of history, we wanted you to feel here. And going back to the senses, um, whether that be through the use of technology, which we had a lot of in the museum, it was also creating these more organic spaces that were relevant to the time. So in the 70s exhibit, you know, there wasn't AR and VR. And so how do we create a really engaging, how do we use creativity and narrative as a vehicle to create an immersive experience without technology? 
And a lot of that was, you know, creating a drippy, vortex-like room that reminded every person over 50 of their, you know, teen years. And people walking through with the music that we chose and the very visceral experience where people were kind of brought back into that time period. And then educated them with the gallery afterwards. So figuring out the layout of how, where to place the emotional elements versus the educational elements to take people on a journey that didn't get boring and that was engaging and that also had a lot of, you know, arguably the most important thing in any activation, Instagram moments throughout the entire thing. Um, and how to create those moments that were, uh, would resonate long after they left. Because, um, you know, anyone can take a photo on Instagram and post it and that's that. But how do we create these stories around, you know, people spending time in prison that are still there right now for these laws that have been passed? How do we create this emotional, how do we make people give a shit? Like, really give a shit when they walk out? And so the process was started with narrative, really moved to creative, and then the logistics of an experience like this, um, a three month long experience, you know, from city permitting to, I mean, staffing 60 people, the logistics and the production side of things was an extravagant effort. Um, and to the point earlier about making sure that your production people and the teams that you're working with are on point, it is so important because experiential is tremendously expensive. And, you know, people are getting paid hourly on their efforts uh, at, a, at a mass scale when you're being a creative director or an executive producer. And making sure that you are rigid in your logistics and really able to meet deadlines and stick to them and organize your thoughts and project manage properly. All of these things on a project of this magnitude, you have thousands of documents and hundreds of employees when you include the agency, the internal team, and the staff. Um, Organization of Logistics, I'd say, was one of the larger learning curves for a lot of people in the project and just really understanding the importance of deadlines and staying within budget. Um, so yeah, I think that the, for me personally, when I approach an experiential event, I look at business objectives and how can creativity and narrative be the vehicle to get us there. Um, and then the rest, you know, falls into the logistics bucket. Can I jump in yeah. after that? You brought up a really good point about, about Knowing your, knowing your teams and having the right people. And, and this is something that I've learned just through working with people. There are a lot of event production agencies out there who say they're experiential agencies that are not experiential agencies. And understanding what you're saying about, okay, sure, we have this Instagramable moment. Somebody's going to create this content. What are they going to do with it? How are we going to ensure that's successful? goes beyond what a traditional event production agency does. And so if you're looking for a single partner, it's really, really important that they they have digital chops, they have content chops, and, and understand marketing, and they are marketers and not events people. Events people are great. They're amazing, like production, like, like hardcore production people, super necessary and wonderful and important. But if you have goals that go beyond just building something beautiful, making sure you have a partner who can actually work in that space and understand it is super important. And, and experiential is the buzzword right now, and that's not always the case with, with some of the, the agencies out there. So that's what I would look for in your vetting process too, when finding partners, is, is really understanding what they've done on the jobs that they've done and what what was their responsibility versus perhaps a broader digital agency or a creative agency or, or, or other partners in the mix. And I love the partner. It's so critical to have the right partners. Um, feel free, I'm going to jump in on this question. You know, what partners have you brought in and how did you vet them? How did you know they were the right partner for the activation of the event that you were putting on? I mean, for us, we spend years looking for partners, um, years and years, because we're always trying to find a new and exciting thing, but we're trying to find what makes sense um, for us for the right event. So I, you know, I'm constantly meeting with people, constantly looking at their technology, um, getting, you know, getting everything signed, get, figuring out how much it's going to be, making mocks, making more mocks, making more mocks, <laughs> making demos, talking with people, and then hopefully one day that will, that will fit. So like Rob is here with Ventana. I've been talking to Ventana for four, four years, five years, and we finally just executed one thing for the VMAs. We did a life-size hologram with up Missy Elliott for, um, for a museum, because uh, she got the Vanguard Award for the VMAs. 
So we had a museum for Pissy, and we have a life-size hologram. And finally, we were able to use Mentonic because it made sense. We, and we've been you know, trying to figure that out. So we, we, we take a lot of pride in trying to be the right partners, making sure they are the right partners, looking at what they're doing, um, looking you know, at what they've executed, um, so that when we are ready and we need that tool, that, that vendor, we, we've got the right person. So I've heard the B word thrown around, uh, budget. How do you guys, you know, how do you figure out your budget for an experiential campaign or activation? Um, you know, which is kind of a broad question, so walk us through a specific example. Um, and how do you stay on budget? Uh, when there's so many things, there's so many shiny things you could do and you could spend money on. Um, how do you really stick to that budget and make sure it's actually meaningful? and you're able to have a great campaign. Um, uh, Cynthia, why don't you figure it out? <laughs> well, I mean, for us, you know, it, it, we do such a wide array of things, and we typically, with what we do, we're such a small portion, you know, of the, the sponsorship or the advertiser is such a small portion of a big event. Um, so our budget is very small, um, and, we, and our advertisers usually don't want to spend that much money, so we really try to, um, kind of identify that ahead of time, figure out what we need to do, and we are, are really just kind of honest with our partners. We have an idea, we have a clear sense from the beginning and clear conversations with our partners, our sales teams, our marketing teams, our legal teams, our <laughs> staffing team, about what, you know, what the expectations are, what we can, what we can't do, and when it goes out of scope, um, that's those are the honest, you know, conversations. When, you know, if, but if it's in scope, then, we need to stay within budget, and there shouldn't be any issues. But when it goes out of scope, that's that's when you know we have to change. Yeah, get change. Yeah, I love those two words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. question: Are um, you know are our live projections, or are there you know, certain KPIs that you're presenting um, to you know partners going into to the major? Do you steer steer clear from that? Um, and focus on, you know, here's the execution that you're getting, and, you know, walk me through some of those conversations. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> um, yeah I mean, you know, obviously when, when we're talking, if we're just talking about the experience, because we also do, you know, advertising, and we do, you know, interactive ads, and that's a whole different piece where there are expectations of news and ROI, but when it comes to experiences, when it comes to events, it, it really, we are very clear that the ROI is being part of that experience, you know, and we do talk to them about what, what they are getting out of it. Um, we want them to be part of that experience. We want them to be, the, the, you know, part of that excitement. Um, we, if they want to have their, their logo on an Instagram photo, we can figure out how, what their expectations are, but we really try to manage those expectations. We try not to do numbers. We try not to do, um, promise any kind of footprint. We just promise that they're going to be part of that experience in a really natural, exciting, organic way. So, how about for you? How about budget and figuring out and, and crafting that? Um, on the topic of budget, uh, I was actually thinking about um, how to phrase this. I feel like it's a little bit of a secret sauce, but I'm going to just go for it anyway. Um, I think it, it, it is really what we how we like to approach it is with the discovery phase, essentially. Um, and discovery phase is basically is to say, like, look, we're, let's partition out some time. Maybe it's a minimum of two weeks because there's a lot of coordination of meeting times and internal discussions on both sides. Maybe multiple parties are involved. But the whole point of discovery is to really hone in on what the goals are, what the measurements are, with the, 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 the scale and scope and the hope, like the big vision could be, um, and flowing that into essentially the like pre-production phase. But what you get out of discovery is clarity on what the scope is to actually budget it against. So without that, oftentimes, you know, we've had a lot of experiences where uh, clients may come to us and ask, hey, we want this X or this date, or um, kind of just throw some information over the fence. And um, in some cases, very few, there's enough information that we can build off of. But more often than not, there's not enough information because the, um, an idea is not a vision. <laughs> um, and I think we, what we like to try to do is make sure that 
what we're really getting to is very, very like a clear vision of what is going to happen um, from step to step. So when we craft and we kind of we approach uh, projects, once we understand it coming out of discovery, um, it, you go through your design process. And um, there's a lot of uh, parallel pathing into kind of the world of technology. We're kind of always working in this space of new tech. So you do also have to do a lot of exploration R&D kind of simultaneously while you're figuring out how do we tell the story, how do we um, uh, leverage the latest technology, what, what is possible. So at that phase, the, and kind of going back to what you were saying about kind of the right mix of people, is having the brains and, and the experience at the table to kind of pull the mix of what we know is out there, as well as of, um, the, the creative, clear creative voice of what we're trying to tell. Um, yeah, and so at, you know, there, it becomes just this iterative process that we take. Um, knowing that there's a particular date down the line that we're trying to hit. The best way we've seen is making sure that it's a very close collaborative and iterative process. Um, so many things change and uh, so many cooks in the kitchen all the time. And so we're trying to be as flexible as we can while maintaining a course of like a particular north is always really important. Now, I just want to, kind of on a related note, talk about ROI. So that's something that um, you know, I've heard a ton. What is the ROI of an activation? How do you measure it? So I'll turn this to everyone. Um, you know, how are you measuring, tracking, educating, um, and talking through ROI? Um, and you know, tools and technology that you're using to um, track whatever the KPI is, if you can walk us through that, that'd be great. In our case, I would say, you know, again, always dependent on the objective of, of the activation. And, you know, whether it's lead generation or sales or brand awareness or brand sentiment, there are, are tools to be able to measure all of these things to a certain capacity. You know, brand sentiment, you can do brand health surveys or brand studies and try to figure out, you know, what the sentiment is of people leaving this experience about your brand. However, a lot of these metrics are... Um, you know, aren't going to give you the most accurate results because they're not touching everybody. And, and you know, essentially, they're not touching everybody, not everyone's going to engage with them. You know, newsletter signups or, you know, email addresses or pulling data from people. And these are all things that can be tracked. Um, an easy ROI is, is, or trackability for ROI is, you know, if they're selling tickets, how many tickets are you selling? How many people are walking through the door? What's the head count? Um, and I think, as the experiential space evolves, there will probably be some more um, fundamental, accurate, and effective tracking methodologies that come to play with these things. But right now, it's really dependent on what objectives you have as a business. And if revenue is a huge objective, if profit is a huge objective, then how many sponsorships do we have to get? How many tickets do we have to sell? And that's how we essentially would find our budget. Are we trying to make money on this, or are we just trying to offset all the costs and be able to afford doing this and create a unique experience? So ROI is a unique one, depending on, you know, one of our ROIs was how many people engaged in petitions to help people get out of prison that are in there for nonviolent marijuana crimes. We had a really good guess about how many people came through and engaged and were really committed and connected um, based on these because I very few people walked through and didn't sign these petitions. Um, we had brand health surveys walking out. We had employees tracking how long people were engaging with certain AR and PR elements of the museum experience. Uh, but ROI is a tricky one because at the end of the day, you're, a lot of this is brand awareness and brand sentiment. And depending on how bad of a morning the person had that came to the activation that day or how much traffic they did, one bad Yelp review can deter 10 other people from wanting to attend the activation. So um, it's, it's a little fluffy and it's, a, it's not, you know, you're not going to get the same metrics from a digital conversion or putting a pixel on a site and seeing how much traffic, you know, they're, it's not there yet. Um, but I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's what you sell the client anyway, because it's not about that. Yeah, it's not for everyone. I mean, if, if, I, if there's a client who comes and says, I want to, you have this for auto clients all the time. Like, they want to sell cars, or they want to do test drive, and they're like, I'm going to set up at Coachella and do this. Like, no one's gonna sell any cars at Coachella. This is not. Nobody can even. Yeah, these channels are not for every client in every situation. And, and 
being afraid to say that actually does the broader um, the broader field of the service. So I'm not shy about, I mean, I would have just turned around and said, well, we could do this. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it's not, it's not for everyone. And, and um, to your, to your point about, about different objectives, I cheated. I went to a media company that then helps me because of the massive audience that we have fulfill all of those digital objectives, right? And, and I did that partially because I was sick of working at agencies where I could only affect this much of the overarching success of a program. And I was like, uh, I'm a control freak. I need to have control of more. And so now we can say, okay, and this is how we're going to get people to talk about it. And this is what we're going to do with PR. And this is how we're going to control the story that's above and beyond. But we also do measure all of those super nitty gritty granular metrics, whether that's somebody literally clicking how many people go and touch something or if it's a digital a digital capture. Um, they're all really, really necessary at a certain point. <coughs> clients will go a little blind to all of those metrics. Um, so the, the, the goal is to paint the best picture you possibly can with the information that you have that's relevant to them. <coughs> Anyone else have anything to add to the ROI? I think the only thing I would add, um, and I am seconding, uh, thirding, if you will, um, <laughs> the comments made here is that I, th you know, it's it's because it's the experiential uh, approach is uh, touches on such an going back to what we talked about the, that emotional connection. You know, how does that manifest itself as an actionable moment? Um, is really it's very hard to put your finger on right now. And I don't think we have enough, uh, if we're gonna be very nerdy about it, we don't have enough technology to track it, quite frankly. Um, and that may be different as we proceed down the road of eye tracking, uh, body temperature, data, more data, basically. Like we just don't actually have enough of those in place that, um, and readily available to then further interpret. Yeah, so I think a couple years back at South by there was there's been iterations of this, but I think there was a barbecue company that was giving people barbecue and had some sort of brain sensoring technology on them and like to show how like when you eat this barbecue, you like this more than when you bite into this burger, you know. And so like ever since then, every year at South by and I know I know y'all recycle ideas too. I'm like, I'm like last year, the year before, sort of did, did a little bit of biometric data and stuff. It's just not there. It's like a gag. Yeah, it's, a novelty. it's a novelty right now, but eventually, and this is still a terrifying future for all of us, <laughs> we will be able to gauge everything that's going on. Yeah. The, the one thing that we do have is, you know, if they do, do experiential or do something exciting, you know, you get a press release out of it. You yes. get a story out of it. You get a video. You get to show everyone what you've done, rather than just the linear spend or the digital spend. You get that, you know, that you have shown that you're a part of it. Public. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Uh, your own hashtag. And yeah, I mean, it's like that is that is the big ROI. I want you to quickly touch upon digital versus experiential activation. So digital marketing continues to come under scrutiny because of fake traffic and bots and you know all the other things really uh, diluting results. So how do you think experiential compares um, and you know can really become a part of a marketer's overall holistic strategy? Um, and especially with digital coming under scrutiny, uh, how can experiential be, let's call it a better alternative uh, for digital campaigns, banner ads, uh, retargeting, all the things that you see, or is it more of a complementary uh, you know, strategy that needs to be deployed. As, since I have the pleasure of speaking to um, media buyers every day, I will kick this one off. Um, right now, a, the budgets are separate for the most part. Um, I think that the companies that are purchasing um, digital media buys, it, uh, on a broader scale, you know, we're like smaller companies or, or Mid-tier companies may have one person who's a marketing person who's in charge of all the channels, right? But when we're talking about about um, you know 
Fortune, Fortune 500 companies, um, publicly traded companies. They, they have teams. They have media agencies. You know, and their media agencies right now have very specific APIs that they need to hit, and very rarely are they willing to siphon off that money for another channel. So um, every once in a while, we'll see. Um, well, that's why we actually have to build tons of content and tons of media. Everything we do is a hybrid package for that reason. Um, so if they have a client that says, oh, we want to do something out of the box, um, <laughs> we want to do something out of the box, and we're able to say, okay, we're going to give you what you normally buy, but also give you this. So you can like look at your boxes and, and, and check that mark, right? What I would say is that the, the easiest way in right now, if you don't have, if you're not speaking to that single or you know, double team that's ending up all in marketing, is talk to PR and talk to social. Because more and more PR is, is being given the experiential budget first, um, as opposed to, um, to digital. Digital is still, I mean, so much money is moving into programmatic right now. Like they're moving away from that first party experience. The, the digital buyers aren't necessarily the ones buying that custom content, buying those integrations. It's now moving into PR, which is being folded into social because PR had to adapt and adjust when social came about. Um, so, so that would be kind of my hint for if you're going money chasing and you want to do experiential. Don't forget about PR. They'll, they'll be your leg in, and the marketing will get really jealous. And then they'll be like, well, we want to take this over and we'll try to take some of that budget and work you into the broader plans. If I could just add to that, um, I think also it's a really good point you make about where the budgets exist. It's also about kind of the purpose of the two, because I think digital marketing often looks at how far and wide they can reach, as opposed to how deep you can get in terms of engagement. So that's also something to consider in terms of purpose of those budgets. I want to quickly transition us into um, you know, leveraging technology to craft memorable experiential activations. Um, you know, who like, among you are using VR, AR? Um, you know, how are you using it? Walk us through, through that experience and what you're actually using and doing. Um, and anyone can jump in. Whatever event it is we're looking at, or advertising we're looking at, we try to um, match that technology with it. So, um, for example, um, we found the need um, when we talk about digital, kind of going back to the digital budget. Nickelodeon decided that they were not going to have advertising on their websites anymore. Um, they only had pre rolls, uh, some mid rolls, and that was it. So a lot of um, a lot of our advertisers invested a lot in interactive ads. Um, a lot of the quick ads, a lot of the exciting things. There was a lot of advertisers, a lot of money that just was left on the table. So we decided to create an augmented reality app. That was the first um, app that you could point to a TV, you could play uh, during Kids' Choice Sports Awards, you could play on your app against Chris Paul and play basketball and try to get points. You can have uh, sponsor, or stickers sponsored by McDonald's that you can kind of see their unique characters and take pictures with that. Uh, so we wanted to kind of move this. So that was one where we're like, where we thought the augmented reality would be a good fit for that. Um, we decided we wanted a really cool experience for Clusterfest, so we thought virtual reality was the right thing for that. Um, if we need some light installations for another project that's coming up, that that you know that made sense for that. You know, so it just depends on who it is, where it is, the audience, because um, the technology is so different and unique. In different ways, um, we've had so many of our advertisers say, "I want a virtual reality experience," but but the audience isn't there, or it, it's not going to last. It's not going to meet their goals. So you have to really kind of see what it is. Make, for us, we have to make sure it's really true to our brands first as well, um, and and because that's when they're going to get that, get out of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think. From a, as she had mentioned, from a you know further reach and more advertorial perspective, AR is very conducive, um, and VR for a lot of different activations. For the kind of in real life tangible experiential, I know that we've used a lot of mixed reality um, or a lot of different formats of this. Whether it's as I mentioned prior, um, uh, 
body censored wall that you use to move through time or whether it's something that um, you're actually the, the consumers are playing with different things that are creating a technological effect that's all consuming. There's a lot of different ways you can approach AR, VR, mixed reality, but one of the things that is so advantageous about it is it gives a longer period of time for people to engage with whatever story you're trying to tell, right? So, you know, a commercial, and I think someone mentioned this prior, a commercial and advertisement, these short spots really are people observing something happening in front of them, but they're not engaging with it. And the time you can keep someone's attention by playing a commercial versus utilizing VR or utilizing AR to be able to get people engaged for a much longer period of time than where they're fully engaged. So this isn't a peripheral thing. VR is not something that you use peripherally, and it's not something that you're going to um, kind of be multitasking while you're doing. This is an all immersive, all engaging thing that, that really, if done properly, can can tell quite a story and have quite an impact if the point is to create emotions that evoke action and response. Um, so this technology, depending on the use case and depending on the objective, is we, this, this type of technology can be a really impactful way to immerse people. I think on the flip side of that, I've seen a lot of activations where they have two headsets or one room for one person to be able to do something at a time. And this is not the point in time where people want to wait in line. And this is not something where people want to wait for an experience that they can't really see until they're in it. Um, and you lose a lot of traction. And that's something that, you know, doing these experiences, realizing you know, we can't just build a wall for one person to engage in while everyone watches. We have to build one that 10 people can engage in at the same time. And that's also one of the challenges that when we go back to out of scope and budget, um, because those types of engagements are pretty exorbitantly expensive and um, are definitely you know, worth it if, if they beat the KPIs and objectives, but um, I think that it just, just depends kind of on, on what you're trying to achieve. Let me go next so you can counterpoint me. Um, <laughs> so the really important thing to remember too about tech is that you need IP. You need to, you can, you can say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll have a, a wall of five VR experiences. What are you putting in it? And if you are working with a brand that doesn't own any IP, you go to Frame Store and have them make it for you. Or, but if, you know, a lot of times that's not that's not in, in the budget, you know, um, or their conflicts. You know, you work with um, uh, entertainment entertainment companies, um, and you, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've worked with a studio. Yeah, we want to have a, a VR experience. I was like, well, what did what did you capture in a 360 video you're shooting? Nothing. Okay, or we work with a bit, we work with a lot of video game companies. We're like, well, oh, you, you have models of characters, we can make something, you're like, yeah, you can't have them. So we, we can't we, <laughs> we can have um, you can have really awesome tech, but unless your clients are aligned on what is actually what those experiences are gonna be, very rarely can you just get something off the shelf um, that is gonna work and um, and actually be a good experience for people. Um, so a lot of times we, I end up falling back on like stagecraft and scenic design, you know, and, and people reacting to, um, I built a forest inside of a, inside of a, um, a um, like a mobile home, essentially, where we put real mulch on the floor and people were like, wow, it really smells like a forest in here. Like, okay, mulch, that's great, you know, we could have <laughs> done that with 40 senses, it wouldn't have been quite right, but I would love to say that that was a, like a purely stylistic choice, and I we have, no, we just, you know, had the budgets, and we had no other solution for mulch on the floor than mulch on the floor. Um, <laughs> but yes, no, I can counterpoint it. <laughs> no, I actually, I don't think I can counterpoint that, but like, I, I do think you're absolutely right. When we're talking about um, using technology, there's, um, you, you absolutely need content. You can't go and put something in there and not have a story that you're trying to tell because then you lose people, right? And I think there's opportunities, absolutely, for something that is um, more amorphous, but you know that also needs to be the audience you're trying to, to go after. And if we're looking at our current uh, pop culture and our you know, mass consumer in general, uh, the trends for uh, consumption of IP is like insatiable. Uh, we live in a world where franchise like, is king. So, you know, if we're not telling a story or extending a narrative 
um, that already exists or kind of expanding the universe that people have been introduced to, it has it takes that much more work to get them to get into that headset, to get into that experience, and to be able to say, okay, this is the price of admission is my my unfamiliarity with it. So I absolutely think it all rests on on having some. And I, I go back to experiential is this ex feeling of extension um, and kind of diving deeper. So even if it's a mobile home with like mulch in it, it's because, oh, I know I'm going to go and um, uh, have, I know somewhat what to expect. It's some very odd thing, but, you know, I, I, what we observe is this, this um, hesitance when um, people can't see or understand what they're about to get into. So even... With that, as just from a design and user journey perspective, there's a, the before you get into the headset or before you get, put the technology on, we want to have some physical, tactile, environmental, even with the staff members, if they're part of the narrative, like kind of helping enhance this like tr transition between current world into this like extended world. So those are things we also want to think about too. I love the mulch example. It just like, totally took me to like a bunch of people at Home Depot buying out all the mulch. Like, for the <laughs> um, I would love for us to kind of dissect a uh, successful activation or then uh, overall activation of the event. Uh, Gabriel, if you could you know, start us off, something that has been really successful, what made it successful, um, and dissect the you know, architecture, the sensory, you know, what were those key milestone moments? Um, you know, that you had people hit. Um, if you could give us like a quick example, something that you've worked on or maybe something else that you've seen. Uh, sure. Um, so we do a lot of work in the tech space, as I mentioned, and uh, Lenovo is a client of ours. Um, and I, um, if you guys are familiar with hardware manufacturers, most of their marketing dollars don't actually come from them, they come from the big chip makers like um, Intel or AMD, and, and then they have partner marketing dollars. So it flows through, and, and all the cool stuff they get to do is usually funded by somebody else. So it's to go through lots of layers of approvals and, and things like that. And sometimes that can be stifling creatively. Um, we get a lot of last minute, you know, three, four week production timeline requests for things. One of the requests we got around TwitchCon was to create an activation um, that was going to give Twitch streamers something unique to do other than just streaming games and that had um, pretty decent throughput for the two or three days that we were there. Um, and so we didn't have a whole lot to go on. Their brand, their Legion brand, is, um, is, is pretty simplistic in terms of, of, of branding. They have a slogan called uh, Sav that Savage on the Inside, Stylish on the Outside. So. Um, our thought was, we're like, okay, we don't have the rights to use any games. We don't, like, we, we, you have to get permission from her. We can't have people play any games. This is what streamers are here for. We don't have, uh, we've got some connection to their talent. They sponsor an esports team. But that's like asking professional basketball players to go play a pickup game. So you can't go do that. Like, all right, what are we going to do? So um, we took a space uh, across from the uh, convention center in uh, San Diego. And I built a head-to-head -head competitive smash room um, where people went in uh, one, 1v1, and it was a timed competition um, with a multicam setup around the entire room where basically you went and played a game and captured the flag and you need smash them, smash them up, I guess, where like you, you put everybody in safety gear, we give you a baseball bat, and there was a flag hidden in um, electronic objects and things within the room. Uh, it was also filled with colored chalk that matched the colors of the brand. And people just went in there and beat the hell out of stuff until they find the flag, hit a big buzzer, and that's it. And, and so it's a really simplistic um, setup uh, for what the activation was. But the, what the, the, the sweet spot here was that everybody here was streamers. So because we had the multicam set up and we had somebody live cutting it um, and, and seeing it, we, everybody who went, well not everybody, but most people who went through co-streamed this on their own channel. So we gave each of those streamers a unique opportunity to do something that they were not going to do anywhere else. Um, and also, subtext to this, like, 
rage and trolling is, is kind of a thing in the gaming mm -hmm. community, so giving people a healthy space and healthy place to do this was, a, <laughs> was, a, um, was, was kind of our subtext to, to this activation. Um, but yeah, it was really successful both in the, the number of um, uh, co-streams we had, but also we had other stations where before and after you got to take slow motion um, uh, videos that you got to post on social to show like before you were disgusting and full of color and after and people had a lot of fun with that and it was social because they could go in with a friend as opposed to um, a, a single a single uh, streamer experience um, and yeah we did that in four weeks so wow, that's that's awesome <laughs> and, and also and I will say yes. and I know all everyone's industry professionals I will say sub two hundred thousand dollar budget for the whole thing including space um, I don't want to work for that amount of money but <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, the, the point of me saying that is that you can the, the, we were talking earlier about what makes a, what makes good creative against budget the skill of your your creative team is what can you come up with within the parameters, right? It's not any anybody can go and be like, we're gonna throw a shark out of a helicopter. It's gonna be awesome, <laughs> you know. But like, what can we do with two hundred thousand dollars in four weeks? That's cool, you know. And, and those are the, the those are the kind of challenges and pressure that I think sometimes makes for the best experiences. Right, it's like a puzzle. Right? Yeah, you know, that's you know, right. How do you deal with your limiting items and make the best event that you possibly can make? Yes. Okay. yes. Uh, so, how about you? Uh, was a great event, something that maybe you've worked on, or you know, something that you've seen, um, and what made it awesome? What were some of the milestones that users had to hit, um, the experience, the whole thing? Um, so, so there was a project that we did um, for Samsung, and uh, I mean, I think just the, the experience and kind of the takeaways, it's again kind of touching back on the ROI stuff. It was that part was definitely a, a hard thing to track. Um, but the, the project was a, a move for all mankind, and, and that project was something where we, um, the, the directive was to, to um, take, take individuals and see if we can um, give them a, a transcendent experience. And make them, um, and it had to deal with space, and it was a little bit more amorphous at the, at the beginning. But as we moved through the discovery process, and as we went through the de definitions, we found that what we wanted ultimately with the client, and uh, we wanted to do, was basically, hey, wouldn't it be really cool to actually walk on the moon and feel what that's like? Not just, oh, I'm on the moon, I'm wearing a headset, but actually feel your of lunar gravitation. So what we did was uh, worked with some partners and devised a incredibly cool rig. Um, and uh, of course, this did limit our throughput because it had to be one person at a time. Um, but it did allow the person who, when you put on the rig, you put on the headset, you even had this little like coverall that made them look like they were like astronauts. Um, and it was a dynamic physical rig that calculated your weight and then um, basically offset it specifically to the lunar gravitational pull. So what we would do is if they were kind of like walking or jumping, we also made it so that it would feel like you're moving ahead and forward even though you just might be jumping up and down. So there's what's happening in headset is you're literally walking and jumping across the moon as the, and in the rig you are basically going just up and down. And that, as an experience, was um, it was just it, it made waves. It had a lot of press. That was really cool. But I think what was so cool about it is this um, ability for us to kind of collectively use these um, technologies and the science. The science thing was really cool. <laughs> um, uh, nerd here. And so um, uh, just to be able to do something crazy, something like that, and and allow people to have those kind of experiences that you literally couldn't have. Except for astronauts. Do all the tech for them right now? Do you guys own that? Did, uh, they, do, did they wind up with that in the deal? Uh, I can't say. <laughs> so I couldn't <laughs> use it? <laughs> oh, we can work out a deal. Okay. <laughs> um, I think we uh, are almost at time. Cynthia would love for you to just quickly answer, um, and then I 
we're going to turn it over to the audience. Yeah. Um, well, I think I mentioned a couple of really great examples that, you know, the Missy Elliott, that was a really cool one where Pepsi came to us, they wanted to be part of VMAs, wanted to, wanted to do something unique and exciting. That's when we came up with the idea of the Museum of Missy. Um, this was, you know, we were, our, our group was a small portion of this huge effort of the Museum of Missy Elliott. Um, but the life-size hologram where people could use the iconic trash bag, they would put it on there and relate Missy, and literally they were, they were using the motion and dancing to along with Missy Elliott, and you could just see the joy on their faces. The end when Missy walked through, and like she did it herself, and was laughing, and Pepsi was part of that moment. It was it was it was incredible. And because we're running short on time, I can't believe it already. Madeline, would you mind answering another question? I just want to quickly do a future cast trend setting. Where do you guys think that experiential is heading? So if you could just keep your answers quick, uh, let's move down the line. I think at this point, experiential is a crucial part of marketing strategy across the board. However, I do think that because it is becoming so prevalent and because it is an expectation, um, the standard is going to continue to rise. And it will be quite interesting to see um, as this trend progresses, similarly to other experiential types like music festivals and things like that that become very saturated, how this is going to stay unique and innovative. Um, I think that's puts a lot of pressure on marketers to not waste people's time and money because that is, um, if they can go down the street and have another experience that's cheaper and more well-deserved or, or um, better executed, I think that this is, quite frankly, the future, though, how, how marketing is going to continue to pan out. Um, it's just going to have to be elevated year by year. And for people like us, that's, that's a challenge and an interesting feat for us to take on. Tall order, indeed. Yeah, we can I agree, plus less sports. I agree with that one. I think I think there's a uh, a very quick time we're gonna get to where we need to understand how to connect our um, the the users and the audience. Um, and their own devices into kind of this existing, and pers it, the, the key word for me is persistence. Um, and how do you take a moment or an activation or event and make it so that there's some persistence of, of, of that experience beyond, before and beyond? Yes, to all of that. Um, and I think from a professional lens, or uh, I think that, that it will become a requirement to be an integrated marketer first and foremost, um, and uh, there will always be specialists who are amazing and are at the top, top, top of what they do, but I think more generalists who have a working knowledge of, of experiential content, of, of how they all work together, I think is going to be the one. Awesome. I know you guys all have burning questions of our amazing panelists here, so I want to turn it over uh, to the audience. What questions do you have? Feel free to raise your hand. Sanat will come over the mic. Hi, so great to have you guys here. Thank you so much. Um, I felt like I could identify with 95 things that each of you said. So um, as an event producer ourselves, um, we are finding more and more, this is just kind of leaping off of that last question, that our, our customers and our clients are coming to us more with multi-level experiential because people are willing to buy in or participate at different levels. So not only are we creating that one feature thing, but it's got to be for the, for, the, for the passive user, you have to create that experience. You've got to create one for that mid-level person who's willing to go that extra step. And then you've got one for your hardcore, die-hard, want to wait in line for that moonwalk type of experience. Um, what types of things have each of you seen or done in the past that really touches on that? Like, is there is there that like for your moonwalk experience? Were there multi levels, or was that like the experience? Specifically for that, that was what the experience was, and mm -hmm. part of that is because that was the uh, concept that went with the budget. <laughs> so I think. Um, uh, absolutely, what you're talking about, we have um, 
we sometimes use the term um, uh, skimmers, dippers, and divers. Yes. And um, I think what we, when, when we're thinking about experiences for that, you kind of want to talk about a, like holistic kind of um, UX, right? Mm -hmm. And you're looking through what is the main thoroughfare and what are the little areas, like kind of I said before, um, where you have areas for kind of little diversions or details that can allow people to kind of dig deeper. Because it doesn't really need to be interaction, it could just be details of the environment. Um, and that could kind of take it a step further. Um, but yeah, I think it, it comes back down to what, what um, creative are you working with? What are you, uh, where are is the most important piece? Because skimmers, divers, and divers, they are different audiences you're trying to uh, reach, and there does need to be a priority set um, of, for that strategy. A, a great place to test that is to do convention center work or you do trade show work, because- That's what Yeah, yeah, so so I did um, the, the Deadpool at, at San Diego Comic-Con a couple of years ago, and- I did the Jack Ryan. Oh, cool. Yeah, so, yeah. I did those. It was good. Um, uh, yeah, with the VR. Uh, no. Yeah. I, I just went into the I just went into the space. Like, I don't know what to do in the space. Yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, um, it was very cool. Yes. Uh, but one of the, I mean, the Deadpool thing was super tiny. We had a 20 by 20 space. And mm -hmm. so, it that was, was cool. <laughs> it was like, what what can we do for the person who's 50 feet across, like, set, set lines? Yeah. It, are, are a lot too, and it seems overly simplistic, <coughs> but it's, it's not in those kind of scenarios, um, especially when you're competing with, with other people too. So, yeah. um, th thinking about that uh, that sort of journey and individual too, but also programming. Mm -hmm. So, um, the deeper the um, the deeper the consumer's interest, the more willing they are to come and spend some time in programming. Also, but mm -hmm. you can you can get somebody who is just a, a skimmer if you know what their passion points are and you specifically put that programming into your space. You can start to move them into that mid funnel area, which is what you want. So um, I think that like, the design and the flow is good, but the spot programming also. Mm -hmm. Really helps with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Peter. Uh, I'm an owner of a design fast shop, so I'm next to the menu, probably your guys' most expensive. <laughs> um, it's been awesome hearing all the input that you've shared. Especially because I never know what y'all are thinking, so it's <laughs> <laughs> really awesome to hear. But um, you know, from my from my end, one of the biggest things that like really hit was uh, the opening question of like, what is experiential? And ultimately, uh, every, each and every one of you said it is the, the transfer of emotion to or getting the interacting with it to be emotional about it. Um, you know, obviously you all are very emotional about the what you put into it because it ultimately like haunts your dreams and follows you home and in the shower and that's sometimes when you have the best ideas. But uh, like when at what point and this is like very on my side, but at what point are you involving the people that are actually like putting the blood, sweat, and tears into it. Because, like, there, no, at no point in this conversation was that team ever really mentioned. It was event producers, it was, it was agencies, brands, a lot of the middlemen, but ultimately, like, something, even for the VR and the tech aspect of it, like, someone makes something. Right? So, how do you tell that story? How do you transfer that energy that goes into making it to? to the people who's, there's an element of like it looking like it's supposed to be there and then it's actually like someone you know killed themselves for the month or the two months or whatever it's going to be done. So there's the, the two examples that I've talked about a little bit before are actually have fabrication involved in that. So the Game of Thrones um, 4D experiences that platform 
um, the involvement with the fabricator was pretty early on, as uh, like in so much that when the the narrative it, there's there's the discovery phase, they were kind of design concept, uh, making sure that the client was really was happy with the direction of where the narrative was going, and we then identifying okay, well it needs to also be in AT and T stores, uh, and then at that point we start to figure out like okay, there is a dedicated space. The thing is also being in a, to it fundamentally acknowledging what your strengths are, right? <laughs> so, you know, knowing we are not fabricators, Frame Story is a visual effects company, and we also we work in the content side, so it was really critical for us to make sure that we had a fabricator that was engaged with us early enough on because we're saying, look, look hey, we're going to trust you, that we need, here's some of the experiential design elements that we need integrated. You tell us what works best to get people safely in and out of this thing, <laughs> you know, safety is, yes, is a concern. Absolutely, and you know, with the the move for all mankind, like that was a really complicated thing to build. So it and and again, a lot of this comes from after the step of like confirming what that concept is and knowing that okay, now it's time to like unleash production <laughs> and like get get going. Um, but I think if you know, there's opportunities for earlier collaboration that's when that that's something i always constantly ask my team is like let's just be realistic about what our strengths are and what can our partners be able to are able to bring to help enhance that experience um and of course the truth be told like the reality is sometimes people just miss that boat miss that window and you're just crap you're like oh my god i gotta, I gotta get this thing out who is going to be the best collaborator with me to get it through this time period? Because that's also something else that's so important is um, who's willing to go on that crazy ass journey uh, getting something launched. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you so much uh, for all being here. That panel was amazing. Um, I learned a lot and confirmed a lot of things that I felt intuitively. Um, so, my name is Nan, I work for an augmented reality company called Include, and we build massive multi-user um, augmented reality experiences at events and conferences. We recently did the Unreal Garden at E3, um, which was a really large activation. We went through like thousands of people a day, um, and we primarily work on the Microsoft Hall lines. Um, so, we found that we meet experiential agencies the best and get new clients when we're already at an event doing another experiential activation. Um, so, what I'm challenged with is scaling out when we're not doing an event, how are we also still getting that high number of referrals or interactions with agencies to get more events and experiential activations. So my question for you is, what is your process for sourcing and vetting technology partners? Um, do you hand it off to a producer or someone internal that's like an expert, are you Googling augmented reality developers? <laughs> what is your process? I mean, that, that's like half my job is sourcing and vetting and sourcing and vetting. It's, tough. it's going to events like this, meeting people, getting cars, looking at it. And I think those people that, that are in charge of it, they, they're con continuing to get that information. Um, that is also why I'm so involved with the VR AR Association, um, which is another great way to start kind of, you know, you'd be going to the networking events, giving everyone tons and tons of cards. Um, meet people that way. I think, you know, for, for me personally, that's how I would let them source and vet everything. And, and, um, and also relying, you know, on making sure everyone, I, I tell everyone I work with, if you have a cousin that has a startup, like, I'll meet with them. Like, and, like <laughs> or your, like, cousin's friend, or, like, your cousin's friend friend. And, like, you're, like, really you're, like, like, you're, like, why come? You, you just come, like, oh, I'll send, I'll send you to Cynthia. And I literally get everybody's emails, but it's cool because it, it, then you can meet with people and you, I, there are things that I've discovered that way there's, you know, where I'm like, really? Are you sure your cousin's going to bet this? So I think when you're open, you know, you want to be open to it um, and, and, and making sure that it's not on you, just on you, it's you're, you're telling everyone in your company, I want your ideas. I want I want to know something cool you saw as, you know, where you were or what, you know, like, I think getting everyone else's opinion is really valuable. Yeah, I, I, D, all of the above. Um, when 
So I'll speak to when I was at my last agency. Um, we would really push for vendor lunch and learns a lot. Um, sometimes you get 20 people, sometimes you get two people, but if you really have something cool, people can talk about it, um, particularly mid-sized agencies. Um, I think that uh, really being a pain in the butt, um, we're so busy, I, I'm just assuming you guys are also busy, um, <laughs> that, that I'll have somebody reach out to me on LinkedIn, and I'll ignore them for a week and a half because I get so many. Um, and then they'll hit me up again, and like, I, I'm, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I, I just not purposeful. I do have so many people here, right? You know, so like, just being really persistent and um, offering to, and, and allowing people to get their hands on stuff. Um, and if you don't get a senior person, go for the junior people because, like, junior producers and um, account managers and creatives, like, the part of how they're Flying their way up is to come to the table with something that somebody else doesn't know and hasn't seen. So, like, if you can't get the creative director on the phone, don't worry about it. Go hit the ACDs up, hit, you know, whoever you can up. And um, you're young, they're young, you guys are fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then they'll, then they'll, they'll evangelize it for you. I think LinkedIn um, is a pretty valuable tool. I don't know if everyone in this room, yeah, there are many as well here. Um, I don't know if everyone in this room feels the same way, but it does take me time sometimes to get back to people, but typically by the second or the third reminder. Um, and I also segment, I at least try twice a week to segment lunches for specifically um, new vendors. Um, to be able to come in and partner some things. I think back to the last panel that I was here, I had someone that I'm partnering with also, um, or that we're breaking on. And so I think that just being persistent and, and just trying to set up some time, because um, people are looking for the newest, most innovative thing that they can get their hands on. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if there's questions. Now we are up to time. We're going to have some networking so until 9, so feel free to ask them any questions personally. Thank you very, 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 very much. fantastic panel. You guys, uh, this was a really great panel of um, women to, to, to speak on this topic with, and I myself as a panelist definitely learned a lot. Yeah, thank, you. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much for being here. So, let's move on to the other room. Thank you all. Bring a snack. <laughs>